All right, so we're going to look at the graph or the equation y equals 3 sine x, sine 2x. So remember when we looked at a graph, the period of the graph was how long it took to repeat itself, right? So from a max to a max would be a period you could figure it out, or from a min to a min, the horizontal distance. Or if you started at a spot and went past a max, went past a min, back to that same height, that would be a period. The amplitude, remember, was half the distance from the max and the min. So if you counted the distance from the min to the max and divided by 2, that's your amplitude. Amplitude is half the distance from the min to the max. But if we're given an equation, our amplitude, in this equation right now, we have y equals a sine bx, let's say, or y equals a sine or cos, y equals a cos bx. Next one, right there. So the A value here can be positive or negative, right? It's a vertical stretch or it could be a reflection, right, in the x-axis. But our amplitude is the absolute value of A. Our amplitude is always positive. It's a distance. So if you're given an equation, the amplitude is very, very easy to find. The amplitude is just the absolute value of A. Because remember, amplitude is always positive. And remember that reflection in the uh, x-axis would just cause it to be down or up, but our amplitude is the distance from min to max divided by 2. So if it's up here and it's like this big, or it's down here and it's this big, does it change my amplitude at all? Amplitude is the stretching, right? Or the, like I guess, reduced narrowing of the graph vertically is the amplitude would change. So it's the only thing that would change your amplitude that A value, right, that vertical stretch, because if your graph is like this and you stretch it vertically wider, it would be like this, or you stretch it vertically narrow, it would be like this, so your amplitude would change based on your vertical stretch, and that's it. So, amplitude is the absolute value of A. So what's the amplitude of each of these graphs? This one, 3, because it would be the absolute value of 3, so the amplitude is 3. What about number 2? What would the amplitude be? The absolute value of 2, so the amplitude is 2. So if the amplitude is 2, how far is it from the min to the max? From the minimum to the maximum, if the amplitude is 2. It's 4. It's double the amplitude, right? And then this one, the absolute value of negative 3, so my amplitude is 3. Because remember that negative just causes a reflection in the x-axis. It doesn't change the height of the graph at all, correct? And then this one, the absolute value of a half. So your amplitude will equal a half. We're not going to do number of cycles within the original period. I don't really care about that. I'm going to do range there. So I'm going to change this to actually be the range, but we'll do that after. For now, I want to do period in degrees and radians. So from an equation, from a graph, you'd actually physically have to count the horizontal distance until it repeats itself. That's the period, correct? So from a max to a max, from a min to a min, from one place past a max, past a min to another place, right? Off of an equation, you always use either the period equals 2 pi divided by b or the period equals 360 degrees divided by b. Why? b is what? b is what? Um, in our transformations. What does B give us? The horizontal stretch. And the horizontal stretch is always the flip of it, right? Well, if we're dividing by B, we're actually multiplying by the flip of it, correct? So we don't have to flip it. We just put in whatever B is. For our horizontal stretch, when we state it, we're going to have to flip it. But when we put B in there, we're not going to have to. Now, why would our horizontal stretch change our period of our graph? if we're from 0 to 2 pi, which is what a normal sine and cos graph are, from 0 to 2 pi, right, before they repeat themselves? Why would the horizontal stretch change how a graph repeats itself? When I was stretching this way, it made it taller or shorter. It would change our amplitude, correct? When you do stretching that way, the max to the max will be bigger. 
Mm -hmm. When you pull it this way, your max to max is going to be bigger. When you squish it in, so you stretch it narrower, your, ma your max to max is going to be less. So the period will either get larger or smaller, right? Yeah. Now, why do I do 2 pi divided by b or 360 divided by b? What's the original graphs for a sine and a cos period? How long does the original graph y equals sine x or y equals cos x when it doesn't have anything on it? How long does it take till it repeats itself? 2 pi. 2 pi and 360. So we have 2 pi and 360 because that's how much, if it was an original cos or sine graph, your b value would be 1, right? The b value is the value between cos or sine and the x. So in this case, the b value is 2. But of the original graph, like y equals sine x, or y equals cos x, what's my b value? 1. So when I divide those by 1, what am I left with? 2 pi or 360, which is true. What's my amplitude of cos and sine? It was 1, because I went, it's a distance of 2. It was from negative 1 to 1, divided by 2 was 1, right? Both of these are 1. So if for, the, or if for your a or b value, you don't actually have a value, it looks like there's nothing there, you have a 1. If for your C and D, your C and D are your horizontal translations and your vertical translations, if you don't have a C and you don't have a D, those will be zeros because that means you didn't move it anyway horizontally and you didn't move it anyway vertically. But your A can't be a zero. Your A is your amplitude. If your amplitude was zero, you'd have a horizontal line. That's not a sine function or a cos function. That is just Y equals line, right? And if your B value is zero, you would just literally have a vertical line because you'd have no period. A vertical line is not a sine or a cos graph either. So your A value and your B value have to be one. Your C value and D value could be zero, okay? Some people try and put zeros here. If they were zeros, they would go away wouldn't exist. Okay, so the period of this graph, we're going to do it in, in radians and degrees. So period of this graph is going to be 2 pi divided by b. b is whatever's between, oops, I'm a little off, sine and the x. So whatever's between the sine and the x is the b value. So in this case, it's 2. So it's going to be 2 pi divided by 2. So the period is pi. Now, does that make sense? I went from 2 pi pi. It narrowed. I went from 2 pi to now it's repeating every pi. So it would actually repeat twice in the normal cycle. Correct? Now? But why is that? I d B value is 2. Why did it get narrower? That doesn't make any sense. If your B value is 2, you have a horizontal stretch by a factor of what? A half. So you're actually halving it, which makes sense. When you divide by 2, it's like multiplying by a half. You, so you actually are multiplying by a horizontal stretch of a half. But we're just putting the 2 in the bottom instead of multiplying by a half. Okay? So that's why the period is half of it, because we horizontally stretched it by a half. Now, this one we could do P equals 360 degrees divided by 2. So the period is every 180 degrees, both of which are correct. You guys give me the period for 2, 3, and 4. So the period of this graph is 2 pi divided by 3. You don't have to reduce it anymore. So it went from a graph of 2 pi to 2 pi over 3, and 2 pi over 3 is 120. So the graph's normally 360, right? And it's going to repeat itself 100, every 120. So it repeats itself three times where it normally would repeat itself. Oops. Mm where it normally would repeat itself every 360. It's now repeating itself every 120. So that's three times in the normal graph, right? Um, this one's going to be p equals 2 pi divided by a half. When you divide by a half, it's like multiplying by 2, so you're going to get 4 pi. So this graph, you'd actually only see half of a period in the same time you would normally see one, right? Maybe like this, and then it would stop, and then it would finish. <clears throat> And then P equals 360 divided by a half. Dividing by a half is so multiplied by 2, so 720. And then this one's going to be P equals 2 pi over a quarter. So it's 8 pi multiplied by 4. And P equals 360 divided by a quarter. It's just 1440. Okay. 
Now, range. The range of a graph, when you look at a graph, if someone asks you for the range, it's really easy. Okay? Because your range for a sine or a cos graph is always written like this. Y such that the minimum is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to the maximum. So when you write it like this and these less than or equal to signs are in the same direction, what you're saying is I have Y values sandwiched between these two Y values. That's what you're saying. This is the low Y value, this is the high Y value, and I have all my Y values fit between those two. You're saying I have a Y value that fits between this value, the minimum, and this value, the maximum. Okay? And that's why these are always in the same direction, because you read from the y. y is greater than or equal to the minimum, y is less than or equal to the maximum, which makes sense, because you always read from the variable, okay, this way and this way. So that's why they're always in the same way. Don't make them one, one direction and one the other. That would be not good. And then y r. Interval notation is super easy in this case, because it's equal to, so it's square bracket, minimum, comma, maximum, square bracket because they're equal to. Now, off of an equation, you're going to star this because everyone forgets this when it comes to a test, and they will ask this with variables. So you can't do it by plugging into your calculator and going second trace max and finding the maximum. They give you variable. Okay? So when you're given an equation, y equals a sine b x plus c, let's say, plus d, When you're given that, the easiest way to find the min and the max, you don't even need your calculator for this. Actually, you don't need your calculator to figure out anything off of this sine graph. You should be able to look at everything and know exactly what happened. But the easiest way to find your minimum, and we're going to see this in a little bit, but trust me for now, D is that um, shift. D is your vertical shift, right, your vertical translation. It's called a vertical displacement in this. I don't know why they gave it a different name. It's called a horizontal phase shift instead of a horizontal translation, and it's called a vertical displacement instead of vertical translation. I'm not sure why they, but they did. So, horizontal, horizontal, vertical, vertical, just keep it that way. Okay? But on the normal sine graph, your x axis is the middle of the graph, correct? Like it goes up one and it comes down one, and your middle of your graph is at y equals zero, right? Your d value actually is y equals zero as well on those, right? Because at the back, you have a plus zero. You put a plus zero at the back because there isn't anything. So what happens when you have a vertical translation? This is called your median value or your midline. It's the middle of the line. It's the middle of the graph. It's a midline. It's a line at y equals zero, correct? What happens is when your d value is not zero, say your d value is seven, you're going to move that midline, that y equals zero graph up to y equals seven because it's going to move up seven. The rest of the graph will move with it, but that midline is going to move to y equals seven, okay? So this d value gives you your middle line always. So if I took that middle line, that y equals zero line, and I added, it, added my amplitude to it, correct? It would give me my max. If I took that middle line and I subtracted from it my amplitude, it would give me my min, correct? So... If you always know your d value, which you do, because if it doesn't exist, it's zero, right? Or if it does exist, it's a number. If you take that d, that midline, that middle line, and you add to it the amplitude, you'll always get your max. And if you subtract from it your amplitude, you'll always get your min. So the easiest way to do domain and range off of an equation, or min and max off of an equation, is you go d, your d value, plus your, or sorry, that's the minimum, d minus your amplitude. and D plus your amplitude. Now, why do people get this wrong on the test? They forget about it, always, number one. Number two, if they do amplitude plus D, amplitude minus D, which doesn't make sense. You need that middle line, you need that middle line to add the amplitude to, and you need that middle line to subtract the amplitude from. So that's why it's D plus amplitude, D minus amplitude, always. Some people want to use the the A value. Amplitude is always the absolute value of that. So if your A value is negative, it doesn't matter. You have to use the positive of it in order to do this. Okay? So another way to rewrite my range if I wanted to is I could say Y such that D minus my amplitude. Another way of saying amplitude is absolute value of A, correct? That's the amplitude as well. So sometimes they do that. 
is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to d plus my amplitude or absolute value of a they could write it y er so if I have that middle line and I add my amplitude to it I'll get to my maximum if I have that middle line and I subtract my amplitude from it I get to my minimum because the amplitude is the distance away from that midline from the middle right So these ones are all really easy to get your min and max from. Why? Why are these all really easy to get your min and your max? The d value is 0. So I'm going to either add the amplitude to it or subtract the amplitude from it, right? So I'm in, in this case, I'm going to get negative 3, positive 3, negative 2, positive 2, negative 3, positive 3, negative 1 half, positive 1 half. But is it always going to be that easy? No. Shouldn't be hard though, you'll just take your D and add to it. Our D just happens to be zero in this case. So a lot of the time people think that the amplitude is the range because we start off with it that way. We're just starting off with these being zero. These are not always going to stay zero and rarely will they be zero. Okay, so you have to do your D plus your amplitude. So the range in this case, I'll do um, set notation interval, set notation interval just so we get used to both. This one's going to be y such that it'd be 0 minus 3. So negative 3 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 3 y er. This one, our min and max is going to be negative 2, positive 2, right? Because it'd be 0 minus 2, so negative 2. 0 plus 2, positive 2, right? So I'm going to do interval. So negative 2, positive 2. And then this one... Whoa, what's that? Y equals the line. Why such that negative 3 is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to 3 Y R. And we'll still do lots of practice with this one when the D changes too. Okay? And then this one's going to be, whoops, I was going to do interval. I'll do an interval below. Um, negative a half less than or equal to Y. So it's remembering it that it's the midline, the D, plus the amplitude gets your max, the D value minus your amplitude gets your min. So when people forget it for the test. If you're like, yeah, it's probably going to fall out of my head, star it, highlight it so you can come back to it and know that, hey, I need to look at this part. Why did I highlight this? Oh, right, I forgot about it. So I would highlight it because when you go back to notes and you see one little thing that's highlighted, you're like, why did I highlight that? Oh, yes, that's why she told me to because she has experience and she knows what everyone forgets for tests. Because people start punching into their calculator and just finding the maxes and mins all the time. But if what if I change them all out to A, B, C's, and D's? You can't punch it into your calculator. You don't even know one of them. Okay. So for this one, we're going to describe the transformations in words and create mapping for the functions below. So this is the original function sine. This is your y equals sine x, or sine theta. There's 0, 0, 90, and 1, 180, and 0, 270, and negative 1, 360, and 0. Okay? I'm going to plot them in a second. So because the amplitude is 2, that means we're going to go up 2 and down 2, and our midline is 0 because we don't have anything at the back. So I'm going to make this be 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. So I'm going to plot the first one, so 0, 0, 90, 180, and 0, 270. Now it just follows that pattern, right? So if I wanted to, I could keep going this way. Now, a lot of people draw this like peaks, like it's like a point and a point and a point. The graph is curvy. It's not like mountains, okay? So this is your y equals sine theta.
that's just these points right here, the basic one. Okay. It restricted my domain between negative 360 and 360. So let's do our descriptions. What's this 2 cause us to have? Transformations do not change no matter what one you're in. Yeah, but what transformations? Vertical stretch, yeah. By a factor of about the x axis. If it was negative, we'd have a reflection in the x axis, but it's not. There's a 3 stuck between the sine and the, zero, and the theta, so that's my b value. That gives me what? Horizontal stretch, yeah, by a factor of one third about the y axis. So mapping my original points, x, y, would become what? Remember, we're moving a graph. Whenever we move a graph, we use mapping. Whenever we move points, we use mapping. So mapping words, the description is exactly what you do for mapping, right? So we have a horizontal stretch by a third, so I'm going to get a third x. Vertical stretch by two, so I get two y. So what I say, I do, right? So if I multiply zero by a third, I get zero. If I multiply 2 by 0, I get 0. So that didn't change. So that's an invariant point, right? Then this one here, um, 90 times a third is 30. 1 times 2 is 2. So there are new points at 30 and 2. So this is 45, so 30 is a little bit less than 2. Hundred and eighty, a third of hundred and eighty is sixty. It's like dividing by three. And two times zero is zero. Two seventy, a third of two seventy is what? And then negative one times two? Negative two. And a third of three sixty is a hundred and twenty. And zero times two is zero. Can we check ourselves? Absolutely. That graph is repeating itself every 120, is it not? So the period of this graph should be 360 divided by b. b is 3. The period of this graph should be 120. Is it? Yes. The amplitude should be 2. Is it 2? From the middle up? Middle down, 2. My d value is that midline, the line that cuts the graph in half. The line that cuts the graph in half in this case is y equals 0. Is my d a 0? Is there anything at the back? So my d is 0. So we're good. So what's the domain of this graph? The domain of this graph, this is actually quite a stupid question, because the domain of this graph is the domain they gave us, negative 360 to 360. You should have degrees or this would be radians. It's a typo. So the domain of this particular graph is negative 360 less than or equal to x. What if they didn't limit our domain? What if they didn't put that little extra tidbit at the top? what would our domain be? XER. It just keeps going, right? Unless we restrict them. 
and my range, we'll do an interval, so then this one would be negative infinity, positive infinity in interval notation. My range is going to be y such that, what's my minimum? Because what am I sandwiched between? Negative 2 less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2. Negative 2, 2. If you're someone who's like, I'll always just do interval, not a big deal. What if they don't give you that as an option? So you need to know both ways because they can give you either one, right? Not your choice. It's not even my choice. All right. Your turn. Oh, and a hint I'll give you. Um, if you want it to be between 0 and 2 pi, let's count how many ticks there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I'd go with 16 and make uh, 4. I'd make it be 4, too. Yeah. So I'd make 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 be pi. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 be 2 pi. How much would each of these ticks be worth then? Remember we count up to our pi. So it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 ticks. So this first one would be 1 pi over 8. What would the second one be? 2 pi over 8. What's 2 pi over 8? Pi over 4. The next one would be 3 pi over 8. The next one would be 4 pi over 8, which is? Pi over 2. Then 5 pi over 8. Then 6 pi over 8, which is 3 pi over 4. Then 7 pi over 8. Then 8 pi over 8, which is pi. Then 9 pi over 8. Then 10 pi over 8, which is 5 pi over 4. Then 11 pi over 8, etc. Okay. Okay, we have a vertical stretch by a factor of one half about the x-axis. We have a horizontal stretch by a factor of two about the y-axis. So our mapping, our x, y, is going to become 2x and 1 half y. So 0 times 2 is still 0. And then 1 times a half is a half. Why do we start at 0 and y this time when last time we started at 0, 0? Notice anything different? Yeah, the coast graph. Yeah, the last one before this was sine graph. Sine graph starts at 0, 0, goes up to 1, down to 0, back down to negative 1, up to 0. Coast graphs, the y-intercept is at 0, 1, and then it goes down, right? So different. So pi over 2 times 2 is what? Pi, and then 0 times a half is 0. Pi times 2 is 2 pi, and then half y is what? Negative a half. So the graph I gave is only going to show what? Half the graph, right? So I'm going to have to either use more or use less. So if I want to draw this, would 2 pi have been a good decision to make this be? I should have probably made it be what? Yeah, 2 pi halfway, make it be 4 pi, right? So what would have been a better way to decide this? What should I have done first off in order to figure out what I should make my x-axis be? Look at the stretch and figure out the what. That tells you how much I need the period. 
So right off the bat, whenever I go to draw a graph, I go and find out my period of it. So period is 2 pi divided by a half. So I know that in order to put one of these onto this graph, I'm going to need a, a period of 4 pi. So 2 pi ain't going to be big enough, right? So first thing I always do is I check for my amplitude and I check for my period. So I made you check for your amplitude, but I didn't make you check for your period. Because if we would have just drawn 1 and negative 1, we also wouldn't add a tall enough graph, correct? So my amplitude, actually, we would have had a tall enough graph. In the previous graph, we wouldn't have had a tall enough graph. This one is a half. So how, how tall do we need it to be? We need to be up to half and down to half, right? That's as tall as it's going to be because our d is 0, and we need to be 4 pi wide. So... I'm going to draw it on here just because that's what I made you do. So 0 and a half, so I'll make this be 1. Make that be 0.5. Make that be negative 0.5. So I'd have 0 and a half. And then I'd have pi and 0. And then I'd have 0 and negative 1. Pi and negative half. So I would technically only have half the graph. So, question, if we were stuck with something like this, because sometimes they only give us half a graph, and they don't tell us the period, and they ask for the period. But they only give us from a min, or a max to a min. Or they only give us from a min to a max. They don't give us from a max to a max. They give us from a min to a min. So what if they gave us a graph like this and they only gave us from a max to a min? How could we find the period? A max to a max is a full period, right? And to a min is a full period. I start a value, go past a max, past a min, to that value again. It's a full period. But what do I do if they only give me a max to a min? It's half of a period. So if they give me a max to a min, that's great. That's just as good as giving me a max to max or a min to min. Just figure out the distance between those two and times it by two. You get a full period. Okay? So if they give you from a max to a max, um, great. But if they give you from a max to a min, that's still good. Just find the distance times by two. You don't need the full thing, right? Now, um, they'd have to specify that this is a max and that's a min to guarantee you that this graph doesn't like keep flowing lower, right, or something like that. So they'll usually specify that. Okay. So my domain in this case was from 0 to 2 pi. So I only drew 0 to 2 pi because my domain restricted me that way. If I wanted to see the whole thing, I would have to draw to 4 pi, right? But this thing restricted me to 2 pi. So if x such that 0 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 2 pi. But if I wanted the whole thing, I'd have to go to 4 pi, right, to at least see a full period. And then the range is from negative a half to a half. Okay, how do we get an equation? This is the catch. Our a is our amplitude, correct? But it's our absolute value of a that's our amplitude. So whatever our amplitude is, our a could actually be positive or negative. Okay, well, how do we find our amplitude? You want to use the formula, it's absolute value of max minus min divided by 2. Or you could say, hey, what's the distance? How far do I go to get from here to here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What's half of that? 3. So the amplitude is 3. So my A value is plus or minus 3. How am I going to know? Well, I'm going to have to go based on what the graph looks like. 
How do I get my B value? Well, I got my period of my graph by going 2 pi divided by B, right? So if I want my B, what do I need? The period of the graph. If I have the period of the graph, I can find the B. If I have the B of the equation, I can find the period. Okay? So your formula, this is in degrees. So the formula we're going to use is P equals 360 degrees divided by B. These can be swapped. So B actually equals 360 degrees divided by the period. So if I know the period of this graph, I can find my B value. Because this B value can come up and be multiplied, and the P value would be brought down by division. So that's why they can switch spots, right? You can bring the B value up and be multiplied by the P, then you'd have to divide the P back down. So what is the period of this graph? I'm going to start here. I always try here first. Cast to max, cast to min, back to that same height. 180. So it's going to be 360 degrees divided by 180 degrees, which is 2. So now I know my equation can either be plus 3 sine 2, at 2 theta or y equals minus 3 sine 2 theta. There's no horizontal translations or anything on this graph, right? No vertical movement at yet because we don't have anything like that. And we know that there isn't any because there's this is the equation they're telling you you have to fill in. And there's no C or D, right? Now, <clears throat> sine graphs start at 0, 0 and go up, correct? A positive sine graph goes up. A negative sine graph would go down because it would be reflected in the x-axis. So because my graph is starting here and going up, it's not that one. How could we check this in our calculator? Well, this is what I would do. Whenever I get an equation and I want it to match my graph that they gave me, I want to walk away from the test knowing I'm right. That is full out what I want. I do not want to walk away and be like, hmm, maybe you got it right, maybe you got it wrong. So what I always do is I go to my y equals, type this in. So I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to go, I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to go to y equals, and I'm going to go um, try the positive one, because that's what I think it is, right? Three. So, oh, no. I'm going to press the sign button. Before I press that sign button, what I was thinking in my head, degree or radian mode. Before you press that button, you slap your hand and you say, hmm, mm -mm -mm -mm. what mode do I need to be in? So I go to my graph and I look along my x-axis because my x-axis tells me what I'm in. If my x-axis has little degree symbols, I'm in degrees. If my little x-axis has nothing on it, I'm in radians. So this one's in degrees, right? So I go to my mode, I stop myself from hitting that sign, and I put it in degrees. Okay, then second mode to get myself out of it or clear 8,000 times till you finally get out massively hitting it. Do you guess? Didn't you clear like 400 times? Yeah, it drives me batty. I like watch people. Yeah. So I clear buttons don't have like all my clear buttons on my calculators. Basically, unless they're the new ones, you can't read the clear anymore because people have used it so much and worn it off. So y equals 3. Now I can press the sign. Yay. And then people are like, theta? I've never seen a theta symbol before. Yes, you have. You just didn't notice. This little x, t, theta, n button here, that just means anytime there's a variable, press that button. It can, this little x will represent any of those variables. So, oops, got a little, little girl chromosome there. X, x, get that? Yeah? You guys are so fun today. So, yeah, it's good. So, do I just put, <laughs> do I put 3 sine x like that? What do I need? I need to put it to. Okay, before I press graph, what do I need to do every single time before I press graph? Because maybe it's set up for polynomials. Maybe it's set up for your brother or sister who boards your calculator or your friend. What do I need to change? Your window. 
If you want to see if your graph is correct, the best way to make sure your graph is correct is to set your window to the exact same window as the graph that you're looking at. If your window is exactly the same as the graph you're looking at, then it will look exactly the same. But if your window is a little off, you might think, hey, my graph is wrong, but it's actually right. You just have a weird wonky window. Or you might look at it and be like, yeah, it looks right, but it's completely incorrect, but your window is so out that you don't notice it's wrong. So I'm going to go to my window. And my x minimum, what's the lowest x I have on this graph? Negative, three, negative 360. I'm going to go negative 360. What's the highest x I have? Positive 360. I want positive 360. Now, I want my scale to be the same. So this is 0 and 90. So what's this going to be? What's this going up by? What's each tick? 45. Okay, what's my y min? Negative 4. My y max is positive 4. What's my little ticks going up by? 0.5. That's my y scale. Um, if you turn this X res up to like two or three, it draws your graph faster. So if it's at one, it just draws it quite slow. If you turn it up to like a three, it draws draws it faster. That's all that does. But I'm gonna turn it up to a three. I was gonna say, and there's always a rebel who puts it like a million and sees what happens. So does it look the same? Yeah. Now, what if I was like, no, it's a negative A, and I had done that first? I'd go second, um, insert, let's see, negative. What would happen if I drew it that way? What if I put the negative A? It's going up, and what's this graph doing? Down. It's the wrong way. Okay? You guys try this one. So this one, my A value, negative 2 to 2, my amplitude is going to be either plus or minus 2. And then cos from here to here is 720. <clears throat> so B equals 360 degrees divided by 720. So it's a half. So when your B value is a fraction between 0 and 1, it actually makes the graph wider because you're dividing by a half, which means you're multiplying by 2. So we're going to have 1 half x. Now, normally my coast graph, you guys, has a maximum at 1. It now has a minimum. So it's been reflected. So it's going to be y equals negative 2 cos 1 half x. This one. Okay. That's your homework, but I'll adjust it. Still.